Coming up on Triangulation, I sit down with Joel Sadler of Piper, and we've got some really cool stuff to show you, stuff that's going to get kids involved in coding and assembling computers. That's up next on Triangulation. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 385, recorded Friday, February 15th, 2019. Piper founder, Joel Sadler. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Capterra. Find the right software for your business with over 750,000 reviews of products from real software users. Check out Capterra's free website to find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business at capterra.com slash triangulation. Hello and welcome to Triangulation. This is the show where we sit down with some people doing amazing, crazy, awesome stuff with technology. I love doing the show. I'm Jason Howell. And uh, I feel like kind of right now, <laughs> it seems like one of my beats here at Twit is taking a look at technology and how that's intersecting with the classroom and specifically how, how technology uh, products, games, whatever you want to, whatever you want to say, Minecraft, uh, kits like the Kano magic, uh, magic coding wand, uh, the Harry Potter wand, all these things are coming out right now that are really inspiring children to kind of get familiar with the concepts of STEM and STEAM and programming, especially. And in, in ways that I know when I was a kid, it, it was a lot harder. It was less, less attainable, less served up in an easy to learn fashion, which, you know, meant that you, you either got it or you didn't. And if you didn't, it'd be really hard to connect with it, uh, throughout, you know, your childhood and throughout your life. Now it's so easy for kids to get involved with this stuff. So I'm super thrilled uh, to welcome to the show founder of Piper, Joel Sadler. Welcome, Joel. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Absolutely. It's so great to get you here. Um, I, I can't remember when it was, it was sometime in the last couple of months, where this idea of the Piper computer kind of flashed, flashed in front of me. I can't remember if it was in an email or it was a news article that I read or whatever. But when I saw it, I immediately thought, this is such a interesting concept, but, but has to be an amazing way for kids to really you know, kind of cut their teeth in what computer science is all about. And it's so now, it's such a now product. And I love, I love what you guys are doing with the Piper. Awesome. I appreciate that. And you probably saw an image of a wooden computer flashing yeah. up on the screen. You know, we wanted that spark to be something that was surprising. Yep. Technology that's in an unexpected way, but approachable. When have you ever seen a wooden computer that actually plays a game that your kids love. Well, you know, what it reminded me of at first, what was the name of the very early Apple computer? Yeah, the Apple Ones that the, were in a wooden case. They were yeah. in a wooden case, and I was kind of, as as my daughter, who's nine, as we were assembling this, uh, putting it together, that was kind of the image that I had in my mind of like, you know, the, these this like perfectly crafted wood uh, as the case that surrounds this, you know, uh, this high amount of technology on the inside. What a, what a cool, tangible, uh, approach, you know, and I'm sure they, the, the Apple founders, you know, they did that probably out of necessity because that's just what they had. And, but uh, and that's very similar to how we started. This was basically out of necessity. Yeah, you know, it's what we had lying around. We had a laser cutter access to that that we uh, could cut what we had. It wasn't plywood. We had this very cheap MDF board, and yeah. the first prototypes ended up resonating so much with kids that the prototypes ended up being much like you see here in the product. Yeah. And that wood is really important for our mission because it sort of signifies, it's a material of craft, it's warmth, it's aligned with things like the maker movement and mm -hmm. design. Um, and so we wanted our product to reflect that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, having kids get inspired to dive into technology as something that they can modify, right? They can take a screwdriver or a hacksaw or a laser beam, cut through and make the world, you know, the way that they see it. Mm -hmm. And so we definitely wanted that first moment, that first picture to be something that drew them in and saw technology as uh, something they can shape. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, we should say, you know, because, because it's a wood case, mm. 
it's also perfect for now because there is a lot of attention around green, you know, being green, uh, yeah. using renewable materials and, and that sort of stuff. If you know, there are so many pieces of technology that I can think of that are absolutely not in any way, shape or form green at all, yet, you know, they're everywhere and we rely on them. So mm -hmm. so that's also a, kind of a nice lesson to, te to teach children as they're building this too, right? Like you, yeah. don't, you don't need a big hunk of, of plastic uh, to be the case and be around forever and ever in some landfill somewhere. Where, uh, it can be something that that feels just a little bit more more neutral, more uh, more renewable. Renewable, and I think what's exciting is kids can look at the kit and envision where all the parts come from. Yes, technology. You know, you look at an iPhone today; it's sort of sealed in a black box. It's hard to sort of see the parts and, and get a sort of understanding of totally. how the bits and pieces work together. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you see the wood case, it's an approachable moment to come in and see. You know, I can see where that wood came from mm -hmm. and then get to the next level. You see the circuit board, you see the battery pack, there's wires. Um, it's all about scaffolding experience in mm -hmm. a gentle manner um, so we can sort of have everyone have an exciting experience the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. So we're going to obviously we're going to spend some time talking about the Piper. I thought before we kind of get into the details around this awesome computer. We've had so much fun. I'm, I'm, I'm so stoked that you're here because my daughter, like she basically is like, oh my goodness, you're meeting the guy who created this thing, you know? <laughs> so she gets that experience. I was like, what, yeah. what question do you have for him? Mm -hmm. And she was like, could you ask him how he did it? <laughs> so we're going to talk yeah, about that. Yeah. That'll be her, her overarching question that she'll want to have answered. Uh, and we're going to dive deep on that. But I thought we would start off kind of with your, your background yeah. because you have a really cool story that leads up to Piper. Piper is kind of the last three years, I'd say, of your life, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but you've done a lot of things prior to this. You grew up in Jamaica. Yeah. And I know that Lego was really close to your heart while you were in Jamaica. Can of talk a little bit about kind of building, you know, the, uh, that, that experience being in Jamaica and the kind of the importance of Lego uh, to your development? Yeah. I mean, for me, I spent, well, I grew up in Jamaica. I just came here for college and it was, uh, you know, for me having access to these toys that were creative Legos and Lego Mindstorms and Meccano, which I think is a rector set here in the mm. U.S. Oh yeah, um, I remember those. These were constructive toys. You build things out of parts. Um, Meccano especially, it had, you know, screwdriver and nuts and bolts. We actually use the same screws that uh, and, and nuts that are in a Meccano set. Okay. Um, that was a very mechanical way to get exposed to the world. Uh, and it taught me that you can dream and if you want to make a you know, an airplane or, or a spaceship that you could start to build the pieces together to shape them. Um, and then at that time, the Legos and Meccano started to get electrified. Um, so not only could you create the physical forms that you could dream up, you could start to make them come alive, make them be interactive, have them move. Um, and that's the beginnings of the early computer revolution as well. Um, so th those early days taught me a little bit about how important those early childhood experiences were. Mm -hmm. That what's the first experience you have with uh, a computer, building a computer or building a, a electronic set out of Legos. I found that it was really pivotal for me being in inspired to go on a career to make things for people. Um, and also growing up in Jamaica, a place with less resources, that taught me the mindset of you don't need a lot of money. You don't need a lot of resources. This is a universal thing that uh, you know every child on the planet gets exposed to educational toys in some form, um, and that was the kernel of sort of founding Piper. It's like what it, what are those early childhood experiences that every child that we think every child should have to get them on their way, you know, in life. Yeah, and I know that it kind of you know a part of the the Piper experience for me has been as a father working with my daughter uh, throughout the whole experience, right? Like she could probably do this all on her own. She's very familiar with Lego and and following you know the the kind of instruction book to put this piece and you know kind of rotate things around so that they match the blueprint and everything. But it was really I know that she enjoyed having me there because that's what kids want, right? Like they want time with their parents, kind of shared experiences. And I enjoyed being there. How involved were your parents 
with this kind of development that that you it were undergoing as as a child around creating with with Lego and and I imagine eventually that kind of you know transitioned more fully into mm-hmm. the technology direction. But w- were they there working with you in this way? Is that kind yeah, of what, yeah, why think, that was? Behind I think this? I had savvy parents who understood that uh, you know rebellious uh, child that might be bo- you know like me that might have been a bit bored with traditional school needed sure. needed that stimulation. Um, my dad was was a civil engineer, so I had that bias. I could see uh, I could see the world of you know imagining things and them taking shape, bridges and so on. Um, so I think the the, the seeds of uh, going from sketches on a paper in those days it was pencil and paper drafting, which I had to do in school. Mm-hmm. I could see how those actually translated to large the buildings and bridges and in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was an important backdrop, and my parents definitely you know took time to find the legos and meccanos of the world that meccano set i mentioned was you know i was i think i was age seven uh i saw another guest on this show that uh even mentioned the same set um there's a pattern here Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. uh, where if you have parents who are thinking about you know what are the experiences i want to enrich my children's lives with um, to give them awareness uh that was certainly the case for me and uh you know, I, I, I think with Piper, we're hoping that, that that then becomes the next kind of option that gets put in. Sure. It certainly makes it obvious to a, a child's developing mind that this is possible, right? You know, it's, it's like the, the conversation we were talking a little bit before the show. I had a conversation with, with my daughter, Lucy, mm-hmm. uh, while we were putting it together. And there was just that, that one moment where she, where she looked at me and I was like, this is really cool. She was like, yeah, I'm building a computer right now. And before that moment, mm-hmm. like she had, like, obviously there's a first time for everything, but uh, I, I never in a million years would have thought, oh, yeah, my nine year old, you know, knows what it's like to build a computer, but that's exactly what you're doing here. Yeah. It's just, it's just yeah, so we cool. want to convince uh, not not just the kids that they can build a computer, but also their parents and their teachers. Sure. You know, we we watch kids every day build build their own computer, so we know that anyone can do this. Yep. Um, and so it's as much for the kids as it is, you know, for the parents to see the potential in their children that that we're unlocking. Absolutely. So then, um, you you know, it, you 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 get older, you go to Stanford, mm-hmm. MIT. Uh, pretty prestigious places uh, and, and directions. Um, you wrote a thesis called "Enabling Novices to Prototype Electronics," which, I mean, that's that appears to be you know maybe there was a foundation prior to Piper, but that appears yeah. to be directly tied to where where you ended up. Even though we'll talk a little bit about kind of the 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 the, the kind of points that you experienced between then, but mm-hmm. would would you agree was that thesis like really the foundation for Piper? Yeah, I think you know having having built a bunch of products to help people, yeah. you know, eventually the main question on my mind is how do we scale this? How do we get more, more people involved in creating things for others, a more diverse crowd uh, of product creators. Mm-hmm. And so at Stanford, I, I got obsessed with the idea of, uh, you know, how do we enable anyone, whether they they have any technical experience or not, um, how do we enable them to create their ideas? And so not just the engineers that I had had surrounded you know, in at MIT and other places. Sure. Um, you know, I wanted to see, you know, biologists jumping in and who are working on the cure to cancer and them creating solutions to what they're seeing in their laboratories. Um, and eventually working with kids, seeing that they had their own ideas as well that, you know, perhaps become the seeds to solve our big problems. Um, so yeah, my, my exploration at Stanford in that PhD was really about going out there, talking to everyone that I could find that, sort of had ideas, Mm -hmm. whether they were kids or nurses, uh, playing with the tools that they had, whether they were Lego blocks or the, or, you know, things that we've eventually put into Piper, like, uh, really affordable microcomputers, um, and just understanding, you know, what's getting in the way here, what can we do about this to make this, turn this experience into something that, um, scales, uh, that becomes something that perhaps becomes a standard way that people get exposed to technology. Um, so that, that definitely was the early work that, Mm -hmm. uh, led up to a lot of that, the principles we put in Piper. Yeah. Well, and also, um, you know, I watched your, your TEDx talk Mm -hmm. about the Jiper knee Mm -hmm. and really kind of what I walked away from that with is, is that it's obvious to me watching that presentation and, and where your work has, has led to that you are at, at your heart, you are a, a creator's advocate. Yes, I that, mean, you, that's you, you, have, you 
your it seems like your big mission is to, like you say, really kind of make or help people realize that they have the ability to create. A lot of people, I think, pigeonhole themselves and say, well, I'm not creative. I don't know yeah. how to do that sort of stuff. I don't, you know, and or, you know, maybe maybe they do. They just haven't had some sort of a, se- a way to segue into it, which is exactly what Piper does. Yeah, and that early work, you bring up the Jaipurni. Yeah. That was a, you know, low-cost prosthetic that uh, myself and some students designed uh, while we were studying at Stanford. And it, it ends up being, to this day, uh, something that's fit on people with missing limbs every single day and that's amazing we started as uh you know in our 20s in a dorm room uh with cardboard and scissors and prototypes and idea um saw that it affected people's lives in a really deep way and these were very formative experiences i don't think you know myself or others were particularly you know special in the sense of geniuses we just worked hard we prototyped we listened to um what the users had to say um and that really convinced me that anyone can jump in here and do this. And then I turned my attention to what, what do we have to do here to sort of amp this up, to mm-hmm. have creativity that we had experienced um, you know, be for all. Mm-hmm. And so with Piper, that was our idea, not just sort of building mechanical things, we started building in you know, two very important other pillars with uh, prosthetics, that's a pure mechanical object in many ways, um, but this world of sensing, computing, uh, artificial intelligence, programming. This is the, the world that was emerging at that time in a way that anyone could actually then start to afford these things like the Raspberry Pi at the time, which mm-hmm. was this $35 credit card size computer, which is actually you know still in our kit. Um, which, every I mean, is, is such an amazing a, a, a thing in and of itself. Like yes. what it has done for computing is just remarkable. And yet, and, you know, and I think I just saw that there's news uh, that they that that sometime probably next year we're going to see the bit the next big very uh, eagerly awaited major update to the to the Raspberry Pi. It's still going to yeah. be thirty five dollars expected to be. So it's this low cost, highly powerful computing environment, which again it just it just means you bring in more people, you ma- you make it more accessible for everyone to get in on this this crazy kind of makery. Uh, coding, you know, a sort of thing that's happening right now. Yeah, and I think that's the the trend we're seeing that's enabled a lot of this is that the technology is affordable for everyone yes. now. Um, you know, what's in your iPhone, the individual pieces inside of there, you can go on a website right now and buy almost every single part yourself for an affordable price. So the missing link was actually designing an experience that mm-hmm. um, even a child could go through and have a positive experience. It's, it was a user experience challenge, not so much a technology bit. The technology is here and it's just improving more and more. Um, what we focused on at Piper was how we actually leverage that in a way that, uh, you know, you package in a box and you have that magical experience that you mentioned that mm-hmm. your daughter said, hey, you know, I can build a computer because that's the spark that years later, you know, kids look back and say, hey, that was a thing that, convinced me that I yeah. could go in that direction, um, whether they wanted to go into engineering or medicine or law, whatever their chosen profession is. We want that magic spark. And, uh, uh, you know, the technology was an enabler of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, this is what we have here is the second uh, version of yeah. the Piper computer kit. So there was a there was a part one. Yeah, this is the sequel. Mm-hmm. Um, and that one you initially launched on Kickstarter, right? How like what was what was your team like at this point? How much time did you spend on it prior to the Kickstarter? And what was that experience like? Yeah, yeah, that was a wild experience. I'm it, sure. You know, we kept a lot of. If you go back and look at the uh, you know the original Kickstarter, mm-hmm. you know things like a wooden computer that you build. You know, we preserved that all the way throughout. Yeah. Um, you know, those days were scrappy. We prototyped, you know, every day. We talked to a lot of kids. Um, actually, originally, we, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't clear that we should even have kids make the computer. We didn't know if kids could actually mm-hmm. come out the other end with a working computer. So with the daily sort of iteration, um, it was really fun. We tweaked uh, the kit until, you know, we could, in a single setting, sit down with your average sort of 7 to 12-year-old and then have them sort of successfully build it without any help. Mm-hmm. Um, so we sort of made it easier or harder, dep- you know, we didn't want it too easy. This wasn't about 
something that you snap together in seconds. We wanted kids to feel, yes, I am building a real computer. And so those early design, uh, you know, sessions were really important to tweak the balance so that you come out with that positive, that confidence building. Because what you wanted, what we wanted to avoid was when we started hearing things, especially around age, ages 11, 12, hey, I'm not good at math or I'm not good at, I'm not creative. You start to hear these things, mm -hmm. um, especially at those age ranges. We wanted to get in as early as possible, convince everyone, you know, every young child that this is something they can do. Mm -hmm. And those early Kickstarter days were, uh, you know, the, the, the seeds of that. Um, they were really fun and uh, uh, and you could see what persisted all the way throughout that. Absolutely. And were you hearing from people who were who were getting involved in the Kickstarter at the time, features that they, oh man, you know, this would be really cool if it did this, and then yeah, that kind of went into your feature bank. It and was <laughs> very collaborative. You know, part of our uh, product, you know, the heart has this Raspberry Pi edition mm -hmm. of Minecraft, which is a really popular, yep. at the time, we learned that from kids. The idea for, you know, the core of Piper, in the software was coming from kids telling us, hey, if that Raspberry Pi, if that's a computer, can it play Minecraft? And I'd never heard of it. Because let's get, let's get be real, Minecraft is is the world for a whole lot of kids. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I had never heard of it before. And yeah. uh, so they brought up, they brought this up time and time again until you know we finally sat down and started playing playing through Minecraft and found out that it was the perfect environment for um, representing the 3D world, yeah. which is great when you need to instruct kids about how to wire things up. Um, so it had that tie-in uh, that was really important in the beginning. Yeah, and I and I have to say, so so we were talking a little bit before the show um, mm -hmm. about Minecraft, and uh, my, both my daughters, five and nine, they're they definitely fall more into the Roblox camp than the Minecraft camp. But I, I have a really good feeling that my my older daughter, especially because she's the one that's had more interaction with this so far, she's like right in that sweet spot. I mm -hmm. think of the age range of this of the Piper computer. She's nine, um, is going to come out of this like with a with a much bigger appreciation of Minecraft. And I think what I what I thought was so cool, what what I feel is so ingenious about this product, is that when you're utilizing Minecraft, obviously you're pulling the children you know, in to a learning environment that they already like. So you've eliminated this like, oh, well now I have to learn this new thing that's super complicated, you know, mm -hmm. all these coding blocks or whatever. And then the experience itself replicates uh, certain pieces of the hardware, you know, within the, within what you call story mode. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's a, there's a part in Minecraft where these pins right here are represented and you show the colored wires extending off of them. And mm -hmm. the challenge, eventually you figure it out, is to actually in the real world grab those colored wires connected to those pins. And the second you do, you see the energy kind of pulsing in the in the Minecraft um, screen. And you realize that the Minecraft is really walking you through these foundational elements of building a computer. And once you do that, of course, then you touch these contacts together once it's plugged in, and now your character magically moves forward. You just created, uh, through the experience itself, the ability for your character to navigate it. And it's just, it's kind of a weird, mind-twisting thing because, uh, like we were talking about, it, it really... Uh, melds or, or kind of creates a connection between this weird virtual world and the real world in such a unique way. And it's such a great way to learn. You yeah, know? That's, a, that's a beautiful description. <laughs> you know, part of, yes, the, you know, having a familiar form that kids, you know, we call this sort of the Trojan horse learning, you know, yeah. the, some, taking something kids are already obsessed with, um, then combining that with the foundational ideas, um, you know, in a 3D world, whether it's, Roblox or Minecraft or Fortnite, mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. you know, what we wanted to do was align with something that kids would be sort of excited to jump into. And then once they've jumped in, use that time to expose what we think are the foundations. So what you described there was sort of, you know, how do you actually place this wire from point A to point B? Um, a th any 3D environment is a great way to walk kids through, you know, the, what used to be abstract schematics is now a very sort of, you know, video, audio, animated, guided exploration that's mm -hmm. a much easier entry point. Um, and then, you know, later on gets more and more complex. Uh, we love the, the narrative of learn to code, for example, and we see a lot of great coding tools out there. Mm -hmm. um, but what we find is when you start with 
putting a wall of code in front of a child um, or ask them, you know, even when they're sort of these visual drag and drop uh, programming environments, uh, which we do have in our kit, uh, we find that it's hard to connect those with ideas that kids will sort of care about uh, initially. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done with Piper is build in this hands-on experience, so it's sort of engaging from the beginning. It had, had the hook with a 3D world that they'd be familiar with, with a game that they'd be familiar with. And then once you've progressed through the story mode, then we expose, hey, if you want to sort of make that LED blink the way you want, um, here's, here's some coding blocks that you can use to modify. So it's, it's coding, but exposed in a physical way. And we found that that's, that's been a much more successful uh, journey for us to get mm -hmm. kids into the world of um, what I call creative computing, you know, sure. not just computing, but what you can create with it. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the, the coding blocks, like you, like you said, there is Piper code and then there's the Piper story mode, right? Yeah. So there's a few different elements that you can get into, uh, within the computer depending. Oh, and this is, this is a good example of, uh, well, I think this is the first level, right? Where you have to kind of connect, you can kind of see that there's the, uh, the energy is trying to, to kind of pulse through. Yes. It kind of gets you familiar with this concept that, you know, electricity, currents travel in a certain way and you have to kind of build a conduit in order for it to pass through entirely and you know as you learn these concepts you go into another level you, you know you add the right thing and boom great you've passed the level and, and piper walks you through and then at some point you get to the point to where you're creating these in the physical realm and not just the the virtual realm i just i lo I, I love it and we, we're having a blast with it mm -hmm. um we're going to talk more about piper kit uh piper computer kit 2 mm -hmm. in a moment because this is what yeah. you've basically just announced within yes. the last couple of weeks and that's mm -hmm. what I've been playing with. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't tell, I've been having probably as much fun as my daughter uh, playing with it. But first, let's take a break and thank the sponsor of this episode of Triangulation. This episode is brought to you by Capterra. It's 2019. Uh, so if you're, you know, are you still doing things the old way at work? Maybe you're a little outdated on finding your software. You can start the year off right by replacing that software that isn't uh, that isn't working for you anymore. Maybe it causes you angst, agony, slows you down. There might be better solutions for you out there, and maybe you even know of one right off the top of your head. Well, you can find software that you love that fits your business needs at capterra.com slash triangulation. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. Uh, with over 750,000 reviews of products from real software users, you can discover everything that you need to make an informed decision. It's all laid out. Uh, in a sensible way, easy to find, easy to search. You can search more than 700 specific categories of software, everything from project management to email marketing uh, to even yoga studio management software. It's all in there, tons of categories so you can find exactly what you're looking for. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution and most importantly, fast. So you aren't wasting time looking for it. You can join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their business. Check out Captera's free website. All you have to do is visit captera.com slash triangulation. You can find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business. That's captera.com slash triangulation, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A.com slash triangulation. We thank Captera for their support of this episode of Triangulation. So the, what would you say, so, so we've got the Piper Computer Kit 2, um, electric boogaloo. Uh, what do you, what would you say is the difference between the first kit and the second kit? Is it, uh, is it a few kind of, uh, upgrades, uh, uh, an upgrade in screen size, I think is one thing that I saw. What were the big requests and what were you able to fulfill yeah, uh, so, going to the, so it was really exciting. One. You know, one of the things we started seeing pipe was a lot of schools sort of reaching out to us and yes. saying, Hey, can this be part of our STEM solution? Can this be part of our maker space? Can this be part of our after school coding program? Um, and so as we started going in and working with more districts and more teachers that um, they had certain requests. And so for learning to code, you know, screen size is very important. Yeah. So, you know, one of the big things is we've expanded the screen size so that it, it better, it allows uh, more real estate when you're learning to code. We have Piper code in there, which is our visual programming language. Um, but, you know, you could put Python or any other programming language that you're already working with. Um, larger screen size, it's uh, uh, 
robustness came up quite often in the classroom. So what teachers love to do is at the end of the semester, you know, we have a curriculum that we ship for educators. So oh, that they okay. have lesson plans. Um, we offer training in addition to the kit. That was a big learning was that for meeting the needs of educators, you know, it had to be more than just handing hardware. Um, so training and curriculum were an important part. And in that curriculum, at the end, the last thing that's done is you disassemble the kit. The, oh, okay. the children, they work two to one. They, they usually sort of collaborate. We love them to work together mm -hmm. and at least in pairs. And you take apart the kit and then you can hand that kit to the next group uh, of students. Um, so it's much more rebuildable. Every screw and nut that's in the, in the kit, you can disassemble, mm -hmm. reassemble over and over. Um, that's important for us to increase access. Uh, yeah, yeah, none of the mm -hmm. screws are screwing into wood itself. It's, that's all, right. it's all going into some sort of a metal receiver. Exactly, uh, which makes it very easy to disassemble and not like ruin the the the, uh, the rivets or whatever yeah, inside so it's a all, drilled piece of wood. It's all re reversible, so yep. we redesigned the kit to support that better. Um, and then also for extended playtime, you know, we've made it so that you could plug the piper into the wall. That was something we hadn't thought of initially, but was important in a setting where you want to run the kit for maybe three, four hours at oh, a time. Oh, sure. Um, so the, these things all sort of add up to a much more robust solution for educators. And, uh, and then for the creative aspects, you know, having a larger screen real estate is very important for us to, to enable more design, right? Yeah. Minecraft's a great tool for 3D modeling, but Piper is also great for learning about circuits and then connecting that with physical programming. Yeah. Um, so we're really building that ecosystem of creation across physical, electrical software. Um, and the new kit supports that beautifully. Yeah, there's a, that's my daughter uh, on the screen right now building. I was trying to capture it as we were going along, and she was just having such a blast. Like it really, the comparison to Lego is is so so apt because I mean now when I think about it, like how you know how many things has my daughter Lucy built, and and what like how how has she created those? And by and large, I would say in the in the real world, it's you know largely it's it's Lego. It's following an instruction manual of some sort. And actually, the Piper does ship with a really cool. I'll, I'll put it on the overhead. A really cool kind of blueprint approach. And I mean, it, you know, it it makes it makes perfect sense. Like I was able to kind of kind of help help my daughter Lucy in the kind of uh, the flow of, of the directions. All right, this is the next page, this is the next page. But really, I just kind of challenged her to, to kind of look at these things and be like, all right, well, is that facing the right way? Should that notch be up there or down there? And uh, kind of follow the instructions on the blueprint. And, it, you know, like, like you also said, and I think this was important to our experience, it wasn't the kind of thing that you could just throw together in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It took a little while. It took some time. But what I thought was so wonderful is that she never got bored. You know what I mean? She really wanted to see this thing created. And so she stuck with it and made it happen. And she was able to. You know? Yeah, and I love that you show the, the blueprint there. I mean, we wanted to show a little bit the real process of solving problems. And building a computer is complex. Uh, and so we wanted that experience to reflect that. And, and we know, you know, you could see from your daughter, she was able to do it. And, and, and we know that any sort of child is able to do this. Yep. Um, so we wanted to just help, but not too much, because well, real world is about solving ambiguous problems, uh, yeah. and the blueprint reflects those hints, uh, and everyone's able to get through it in the yeah. end, and feels really proud at the end. If it's too easy, it doesn't it doesn't feel like you're doing the real thing. Totally. And that that's not just physical building; it's the same for electronics and the same for programming. Uh, you know, everything in here is is there's no sugar coating. The wires, the LEDs, the buttons, they are the same buttons that you would go in to, uh, from the manufacturer and, and buy. And the same tools that we use as engineers, uh, they are the real tools. And so that's a part of our sort of authentic core values is expose the real world as much as possible down to its core and then create those experiences like that guided blueprint that just gently nudge, nudge people along in a way maybe they didn't realize in the beginning that they, uh, they had it in them. And I, I believe I saw and uh, I, I found somewhere read an interview where you had mentioned uh, a kid or some, someone had created like like when I think of like modularity around mm. the system, I 
I automatically go to the technology aspect because it is mm-hmm. a Raspberry Pi and there's so much creativity yes. happening around the Raspberry Pi. But I think I read that that you mentioned that there was somebody who had created like a, a carrying handle so it could be carried like a laptop case or yeah. something like yeah. that. Yeah, kids have all kinds of ideas about how they, you know, we, we wanted it to feel open like, oh, I could go in and modify that. Uh, you know, one child felt very strong. It should have a handle and a ca- yeah. carrying case and uh, 3D printed a handle and screwed it in. Uh, <laughs> so we love that. That's exactly how we know we're, we're kind of moving in the right direction when we invite that sort of, you know, direct creativity mm-hmm. and, and sort of solving problems in a way that, uh, you know, they felt that that's, uh, that that's what they wanted to modify. We yeah. want to see more of that. And the Raspberry Pi, as a you know one of the most successful uh, computers of all time, mm-hmm. uh, is also a great place where there's lots of projects uh, that people pull the Raspberry Pi out of the kit, and then are then able to sort of build their own smart device. That mm-hmm. you know instead of having this whole shell of a computer, what we're really excited about is what what people do next after that. Now that they feel confident, um, they can remove the Raspberry Pi, plug it into you know, their own monitor or, or make keep it, it plugged into this monitor. Keep it I mean, plugged the, in. the thing works plugged into this monitor. Just swap out that SD card with a, an SD uh, micro SD card that has a different image on it. Yeah. I think I just saw news a couple of days ago that now like Windows 10 can be installed on a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, the world you of computing. Do so much with this dang computer. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And we just wanted to show people like what the potential was. Yeah. And, and so it's really the steps afterwards that are really the, the things we're proud of. Yeah, uh, kids sort of going beyond and inventing in open-ended ways. Um, so obviously, Minecraft uh, Pi Edition software running on the inside. I guess what what I'm thinking of is like open source versus mm-hmm. not as open source. <laughs> like, yeah. what what about that? What about creative? You know, how how uh, kids or anyone really can can work in kind of with the open source aspects of this? Uh, what what kind of are they going to run into if they? go down that road what i love about the like the community that's come up around here things like the minecraft raspberry pi edition are creative commons and that's you know a very much in our line we, we want to make sure that the standard tools especially for these educational purposes are available to everyone without um sort of barriers mm-hmm. um so i and i think around the raspberry pi a lot of the content that is out there is all under creative commons license and so our, our philosophy is definitely Let's do whatever we can to make sure that we're maximizing access to as many people as possible. And so, you know, as much as possible, we like things to be fully open uh, mm-hmm. and fair at the same time. Mm-hmm. Right on. Um, can, kids can create. I mean, I, I know that within the the Minecraft story mode, there are elements of it that are more open world sort of things. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. why don't you you know come up with something on your own and create something. Um, is it possible for, for kids who are creating with these to share their experiences with other Piper users? Any any plans for some sort of like a, a sharing community of sorts so that, you know, it, it is what it is out of the box, but then mm-hmm. it can be opened up and expanded to a whole host of what everybody else is doing with it? Yeah, we, we love when, when you see our social media, if you go on uh, Twitter, for example, I think our handle is Start With Piper. We love to see people sharing what they've built. Uh, whether it's physically or inside mm-hmm. the game, um, mm-hmm. you know, using something like Raspberry Pi Minecraft, kids can do what they're used to, which is creating their, uh, you know, ideas in 3D little blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's always been a, a core part of that software. Um, but what's really exciting is when they start to envision um, 3D combined with some circuit. Um, a good exercise if you have children that are playing Minecraft frequently is to ask them, to show you what they're creating in their houses. You know, I was really surprised to see, uh, you know, one nine-year-old had this elaborate uh, treasure chest that detected when her friends came in in the virtual world uh, and the floor would kind of drop out. There'd be some lava, it was booby-trapped. Um, but that's showing a real fluency of, uh, of uh, computational fluency. Mm-hmm. This is conditional logic. This is, you know, Absolutely. Ad- you know definitely the level that we, we wanted to sort of embody you know, for our kids. Um, and so this kind of gets to this whole language of creative computing that we, we see that, you know, instead of math and just math and English, uh, which we all agree is really important in schools, you know, the new language of, of the future is, is, is imbued with computing. And so we think that, you know, creative computing 
technology is sort of the next second language, let's say. Um, and so I think these tools are, uh, like I mentioned with this uh, story of the nine-year-old and demonstrating the booby trap treasure chest, that fluency is what we're trying to amplify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the development of their, their attention to logic. Yes. And uh, yeah, these are all skills that will only increase in, in necessity in, mm -hmm. the, in, the, in just the, the, the real world, the workplace, when as they grow up, it's gonna be more and more important. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they're gonna see a whole lot of this proliferation of AI. We're at the beginning of that right now. Uh, I don't know how, how or if or when that that comes into play with the Piper, but I mean yeah. that's another skill that that could potentially be yeah. something to learn from as well, well. Well, I think what we're seeing is you know the the jobs of the future. We don't we don't even know exactly what they're going to be. We just know right. that those jobs are going to be very different from what yeah. they are right now. So I think the education system is trying to adapt at the moment, and so our our part in this is to sort of make make our statements about what we think are important. Uh, AI, robotics, automation um, are important trends uh, that we know are going to be part of the future workforce. So what we're trying to do is to just expose the fundamentals, you know, right now at the earliest age possible, so that those I those ideas aren't so abstract. Mm -hmm. You know, the robots are not coming to get us. <laughs> uh, we need to program them as much we, as we keep thinking that they're going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not not quite there yet, yeah. uh, and we certainly need folks to program them who have that fluency that I'm talking about. Sure. Um, so, so we'll bring about that future faster if we have more, more kids having experiences like Piper and things like that. Um, and, uh, and then in that process, I think we'll have a deeper understanding about, you know, what does AI mean for, for the future? Um, sure. Uh, I'm really excited about that as the future of, uh, you know, if you think about the economy and, and sort of what we need, uh, you know, we, we need innovators who understand technology, um, w whether it's in the medical domain, for example, where, mm -hmm. I, where I did things like prosthetics. That's a great example of if you have more diverse creators thinking about those problems and having that fluency from an early age, we're going to see much more uh, creative solutions to problems faster. And I think that's important for just as a, us as a society. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. How do you think uh, com uh, schools are doing with computer science? I mean, uh, yeah. uh, I know you know it, it's come a long way, and it, it's vastly different from when I was a kid. And uh, you know, mm -hmm. had had some you know computer in the classroom, and all it really did was play Oregon Trail. Or you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I yeah. can't really think of very many instructive, and definitely not in this sense, yes. uh, ways that that teachers back then were were trying to. Uh, educate us around you know mm. what the computer could be and everything. Have sc have schools kind of caught up? Do you think there there are some places where they're falling behind? Are they not paying enough attention to it? What do you think? Yeah, I think I think the U.S. schools are uh, catching up in that. I think we all agree that this is an important thing to have kids exposed to computer science. Um, I think where we're still have a lot of work to do is uh, how that actually gets put in the fabric of the daily sort of right. school system. It's still somewhat optional, um, at least in the US. Um, other countries, it's not optional. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, what, what's really important is actually uh, the teachers is what we found was one of the limiting factors is mm -hmm. that you have a, you know, a workforce of teachers right now who maybe don't have any background in uh, programming, they also maybe aren't as confident um, to dive in. And so part of the Piper Kit 2 and, and the, the classroom, uh, Piper Classroom we call it, which is the hardware plus all of the other things we think educators need, part of what we're doing there is addressing the, the root cause of what we think is blocking, say, computer science in schools, which is let's go in there, let's make this turnkey so that a teacher, regardless of what background they're coming from, we already know, you know, any kid can build their own computer and program it. So why not bring that up to the next level and have any teacher be able to teach confidently skills like computer science? Um, and so, you know, part of our approach here is, uh, you know, give teachers that same experience, uh, but not just computer science, give them the whole picture of creative computing, physical, mm -hmm. electrical programming in context. So it's not abstract. Um, and then we're, we're seeing great results now in, in U.S. schools. You know, we're in a, about 600 pilots right now with uh, the That's Piper great. classroom kits. And uh, I think this is a kind of approach we, we encourage uh, others to jump into. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I know that I know that you've also been involved in hackathons uh, with with Piper. How how has that kind of materialized? What what does that look like? Yeah, what's, what's great is you know once you've gone through what I consider the you know the boot camp yeah. of uh, Piper, this the building, the story mode, um, teachers who who want to give these open ended uh, you know problem solving sessions you know, we have these hackathons or whatever, whatever they, you know, you want to call it was basically a session where we come up with a problem and uh, get in a room and then make solutions to those problems. Um, so what's great about uh, Piper is that the same parts that you use in that kit, for example, the Raspberry Pi can be removed and then, you know, put into, you know, a solution that senses your air quality, right? Mm -hmm. Or senses the temperature and humidity for a scientific uh, problem that, that someone's facing. Um, so, so these hackathons are things we're seeing pop up more and more, and they're a good reflection that we're getting to that creative fluency that, that's all part of our mission, yeah. for empowering kids. Yeah, right on. Um, one thing it just occurred to me when we were talking a little bit about, you know, kind of uh, the classroom and technology and how that, you know, how, how schools are doing around this. I realize that a lot of times they're the hurdle to overcome kind of lies in the hands of parents who mm. maybe uh, to some degrees are thinking of computer science in terms of that tablet screen or yeah. that very passive kind of experience, uh, you know, screen devices that kind of silo silo the user away from from learning. It becomes this kind of passive thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I do think that something like Piper helps helps to bridge that divide. But um, how how do you think parents can can be better involved or better better understand kind of the I don't know the the, the complicated scenario that we're in right now where technology isn't one thing it yeah. can be many things yet parents will be resistant to it because it is technology you know what I mean yeah. I don't know if I we came, see well across. we see a lot uh, a lot of parents who uh, engage with us you know they're they're coming from a world of. Uh, let's say iPads in, in the home yes. that uh, are primarily being used to consume content. For Absolutely. example, you know, classic thing is what, you know, my kids watching YouTube videos of Minecraft when they're not playing Minecraft, they're, you know, yes. watching hours of uh, YouTube there. Um, so I think this was the reality that we were seeing as we sort of went into homes and talked with parents. Um, you know, we, we didn't think a solution of no screens is the right one. I think coexisting, you know, and, and Piper was meant to be um, sort of, Let's take the screen time, but make it valuable, make it educational. Um, and so for parents, I think you, you sat down with your nine-year-old Lucy and, and built the kit together. Those are the kind of experiences that we like to encourage for the parents to get familiar themselves with the, you know, with the foundations. You know, Piper is as much for the, the parents around the kids as they are for the kids themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's an important next step is, uh, you know, parent, parents could buy a piper today and uh, and build it and i think that becomes an important attitude change for uh, how technology can be for their kids which is it's about creation in addition to consumption sure yeah although they they will always also enjoy sitting down with youtube and watching somebody else yeah. play but giving them the opportunity to you know get excited about being you know interacting uh as well um so that that isn't always just the the knee jerk kind of go-to place when it comes to technology, mm -hmm. uh, creating more options. And I know that having the Piper in, the, in our house has definitely created that. They, mm -hmm. they want to turn to that thing uh, instead of maybe asking for a tablet or, or whatever uh, to watch something passively. Mm -hmm. You also advocate for creative computing, which is kind of, kind of what we're talking about yeah. here, right? Like creative computing is really just all of these pieces coming together mm -hmm. so that someone can feel empowered to uh, take take charge and and create. Um, you've done a lot of work in this field, uh, and I know that you've done. You know, some of your talks have kind of focused on this, but mm -hmm. um, just to kind of like round us out, like yeah. talk about the importance of that and and kind of what you envision uh, that turning like the Piper kind of turning into with that in mind. Yeah, well, I think you know, computation, computer science. We talked a bit about uh, electronics. Uh, the physical world, you know, the, these are all ideas that fall under um, an umbrella I call creative computing, which is about not just the individual pieces, but all of them together being put forward in a way that you're solving problems, you're creating things rather yeah. than consuming. 
Um, and so what we're trying to do with Piper and all of our products is expose all of the elements, the anatomy of you know, what we think is foundational so that anyone who has an idea uh, for a, pr a problem they want to solve can, can eventually build it themselves. And so that starts with things like uh, you know, being exposed to the Raspberry Pi and, and being able to be comfortable wiring sensors up directly and being comfortable with adding in programming. So, you know, I think the future of creating computing is ex exactly what we're doing now, which is showing that, you know, kids can do it. And mm -hmm. probably if a kid can do it, any anyone can do it. So we're really excited about that for uh, sort of exposing, um, you know, the whole world to this. Yeah, I love it. I love what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Playpiper.com is where people, should go, people yeah. should go to to kind of take a look at more. We didn't even talk about the mm -hmm. accessories. You guys had an announcement a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, new accessory kind of kits that follow the same aesthetic, right? Like that one of them yeah. is a game controller and it's totally a game controller that you build made made out of wood, but it's it's a game controller nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. All our all our things follow the same DNA. That's so you great. Gotta, you got hands on. You got to build it. You'll understand the foundation, and it's gonna be things that your kids are really excited to jump in and do uh, on their own. Yeah, I know that my kids will will enjoy at some point getting the game controller. Uh, even though my five-year-old, uh, maybe we didn't talk about this during yeah. the episode, but we talked about it prior to the show. Her and I had some really great, like a really great time collaboratively controlling a character because yeah. in the early stages of Piper, you are you are left with these wires that you've wired up and in order to go forward, you have to touch the two colors together and that moves your character forward. So it's a very interactive, but in a very different mm -hmm. sort of way than I think we're all used to having a controller to move character. Mm -hmm. Instead, she's she's telling me, touch the blue wire so that it moves forward while I touch these wires so that it jumps mm -hmm. so that we can get through this part. You know, and it was like, wow, we're both working together to, to control this character. I know at some point they're gonna be like, but give me a controller. Me a Let's controller. build a controller yeah. instead. Yeah, yeah well, I, I love that collaborative, uh, and that was definitely intentional on in our part. Is yeah. making sure that the experience was, you know, something that actually sort of taught you a little bit about, you know, solving problems is all about teamwork. Ultimately, yeah. you're not going to invent the future without working together. You know, great as a team, and absolutely, um, those are those early early uh, sparks of that. Yeah, and and you know, it taught her the lesson that uh, on a on the technology side of things. When you press up, you're essentially touching these two contacts together. You yeah. know what I mean? And 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 so that that understanding of how it works under the hood is is invaluable and something that I never would have imagined I would have approached with my five year old. Uh, you know, but yeah. yet this is a concept that she gets now. Yeah, touch the contacts. The circuit is complete. The character moves forward, and she's five, and she gets it. Yeah. Oh, so, that's incredible. Yeah. It's <laughs> I, well, you know. My daughter is incredible, but the Piper yeah. also, you know, allows this for all all children, and that's why I'm so excited that I got the chance to to bring you here today. And, yeah. and thank you, spokesperson, for, for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I've just had a lot of fun, yeah. and uh, and I, I love this could, that where we're at right now with technology and how empowering that is for children. Mm -hmm. Really, for me, if I can do something to help my daughters realize that they have the ability to choose who they want to be and mm -hmm. to spark, you know, cre create a spark in something like technology. They, they know their dad, you know, goes to work and is on YouTube. Like that's the thing they care about most as far as my job is concerned, but they know that I, I work with technology, but this allows them to have some ownership in it mm -hmm. and to really understand. And like you said, this is kind of the, the beginnings of, you know, when they look back, they can be like, well, I remember when I created a computer when I was nine and maybe that led to this. Maybe it didn't, but it was still a great experience. You know what I mean? They have the ability to make that decision. Yeah, I'm really excited to, to see uh, how it turns out see. with your daughters and, and that we have many more stories exactly like that. Right on. Yeah. Joel Sadler, uh, founder of Piper, of course, playpiper.com. How much is the kid? Is it two ninety nine for kind of the starting point? Yeah, yeah. And then for educators, it's uh, you know you can go on our website, Piper Classroom Bundles, different pricing. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. Well, then I'm gonna have to throw my uh, throw my school towards the website yeah. and have them have them take a look because 
this this fits in. It's a Montessori school, and it's like ha- all hands on. All hands on, yeah. So it's like one hundred percent in line with with their mission. So, mm-hmm. uh, Joel, thank you so much for coming up, and I know you drove up from San Francisco and all yeah. the rain and everything. Thank you for my pleasure <laughs> <laughs> battling the elements. Any time for a Piper parent. Right on. Yeah. Cool. Uh, this has been a lot of fun talking with Joel. Uh, we talk with a lot of really amazing people on this show each and every week, and you can check it out by going to twit.tv slash tri for triangulation. Go there and you will find all of our episodes, uh, more than 384 of them. Uh, We've got quite a few interviews. So if you haven't uh, gone through the list, you can find so many awesome names and get caught up. Uh, We do record live every Friday at 1130 a.m. Pacific, 230 p.m. Eastern, 1930 UTC. You can always watch us live if you like twit.tv slash live but you probably just want to be subscribed to the podcast and again that's twit.tv slash tri for all the information to subscribe i'm jason howell thanks uh to our producer anthony uh for setting this all up and and have the making this uh, go so seamlessly and thanks to you for watching we'll see you next week on triangulation bye everybody